Hello and welcome to Confused Reviews, where cartoon drawing reviews movies, and we finally made it folks, the final Hellraiser movie to date, 2018's Hellraiser Judgment. This entire movie and production revolve around one man, Gary J. Tunicliffe. Around the time Bloodline was released, Tunicliffe, who had done some special effects for Hell on Earth, pitched Hellraiser Holy War to Dimension Films. And then Scream came along and made a huge stir in the industry, leading to a non-self-aware horror story to be overlooked by the studio, and the series was instead re-evaluated. He continued to provide special effects on most of the direct-to-video sequels, and was disappointed with how mediocre the series had become. He was then offered the opportunity to write and direct the ninth movie, and ended up writing the script for Revelations, but couldn't direct due to prior commitments with Scream 4. So I guess technically, Scream has both screwed over and saved this man. Jump ahead to after Revelations released to entirely negative reception, he once again tried pitching a sequel to Dimension, but they weren't interested in making another Hellraiser movie so soon after Revelations. Fast forward to 2017, and they realized, oh shit, we have to make another Pinhead movie or we lose the rights. So they finally told Tunicliffe he could write and direct the 10th installment. His whole plan was to innovate, not replicate, being he tried making a cookie cutter Cenobite movie, and it was... awful. He has even said that he made judgment for him, and that's something I really respect. But just like last time, Doug Bradley refused to return as the lead Cenobite, stating he was disgusted with the quality of the recent movies, and was also told that he'd have to sign a non-disclosure agreement just to read the script, just in case he wanted to put the screenplay on blast for being a giant pile of shit. So basically, this is where the franchise is at at this point. You know I have to do this. I know. <laughs> So let's dive into the Hellraiser movie to push the series into double digits, and see if this passion project paid off, or is just another bad sequel to add to the pile. This is Hellraiser Judgment. So the film begins with Pinhead whining about how sins have become supercharged due to modern technology, and how this aging titan of torture is finding it a lot harder to find people intrigued by a wooden box. I mean, if you want to go modern, use the game from Hellworld. Apparently, it was super addictive. We flash to Carl, played by Jeff Fenter, receiving a mysterious letter instructing him to head to a vacant house, and he immediately pops over there. I don't know, I feel like that's not the right way to go about that. That's how you get a kidney stolen. He heads inside, only to be knocked out and eventually wake up face-to-face -face with the Auditor, played by writer-director Gary Tunicliffe. This new Cenobite is not only a recycled skin for Pinhead from the supposed remake, but is also played by Tunicliffe himself solely because they couldn't afford another actor. Which is fine by me, because I think Gary does a fine job. So let's just dive in, shall we? Because not only does he look like Stanley Tucci got struck by lightning, but also feels like if Hans Londo was an actual demon. Which is cool. The Auditor begins his interview as we find out Carl! Here is a total scummy piece of shit, and after the paper inked in Carl's blood is complete, some guy sweatier than a gym bike seat waddles in. He whips out a bottle of children's tears, decides to garnish his snack, and then chows down on the paper mache. It's super gross, and doesn't really add much to the scene. This nasty fuck then vomits into a funnel, where the oatmeal-like substance is then sloshed around by three topless women. That's not a sentence I ever expected to say out loud. Anywho, the verdict is what you'd expect. And before long, we see another new Cenobite, the Butcher, who looks like a hodgepodge of Leatherface, The Mask, and Farah and Tor. This big bastard doesn't do much but let out the Surgeon, who slashes Carl up and rips off his skin. And to wrap up this overly long opening, the ladies are covered in his blood. That's it. Flashing away from the abandoned Myers house, we arrive at the Nakatomi building and see a stumbling woman entering her apartment. Once inside, she notices an arrangement of candles that she didn't put there, and assumes her ex-boyfriend did it? Some people are really fucking stupid. She then gets a good one to the kisser, and we find out that yes, there was a bad guy in her apartment. I feel like a cactus would have seen that coming. Later on, we see two brother detectives, Sean and David, played by Damon Carney and Randy Wayne? In case you don't remember, Mr. Wayne starred in one of the biggest cinematic abortions ever made, The Dukes of Hazard: The Beginning. Well, there goes my good mood. Fuck. Dollar Store Rick and AJ Simon talk about nothing of importance for a moment. You're not missing much. Detective dipshits arrive at the crime scene, only to see a video of a recently departed skank playing on a loop. I worship this little guy. Remember that line. It'll be important in a minute. We also see a message splashed into her carpet, as well as this glorious exchange. Doesn't this seem a bit basic for the preceptor? The fuck are you? What are you doing creeping around a murder scene at nighttime? You wanna end up dead? Oh my god, there's so much wrong with this 20 second scene. 
First, why would she quietly shuffle into the room if she could hear and see these two detectives? Dramatic effect? Second, can't these two idiots see the giant golden badge? Isn't that why it's there? And third, wouldn't this fresh crime scene be swarmed with officers, detectives, bright lights, crime scene cleaners, and people taking fingerprints? Surely not only three officers working in the dark. Back to the standoff, Christine Edgerton, played by Alex Harris, is catching the two up on the motifs of a serial killer called the Preceptor, who apparently is really into being very shocking and gross with his murders, and punishes the victims for their sins. He also uses parts of the Ten Commandments as his calling card, which does not at all remind me of, oh, I don't know, the Zodiac Killer, Jigsaw, John Doe from Seven, or the actual Ten Commandments killer from American Horror Story. What I'm trying to say is this shit isn't wholly original. Plus, the uninspired, boring way it's presented doesn't help either. The body bag then starts shaking and squishing, and we see the preceptor did the worst crime known to human civilization. He put her dog inside her corpse. Oh my god. How dare that bastard torment the dog. Oh yeah, and I guess it's sad she's dead too. And in case you were wondering, the reason she was killed was because of that video from earlier. I worship this little guy. Man, the Preceptor must be one dense motherfucker if he believed she actually worshipped her dog. On second thought, it makes sense. Later on, the three get acquainted, and Sean heads home. Oh, and he's late for his wife's birthday. I'm sure she'll be understanding, realizing he was working, and will- Happy birthday to me. Oh. Or she'll just act like a bitch. Goody. 1985 Lorraine Baines here then continues to be rude, but that doesn't matter as we return to the cops and get a rundown on the Preceptor's resume. It's as textbook serial killer as Rob Zombie's Michael Myers. Oh, and Sean also has a very extensive grasp on said killer and knows what his name means. A precept is a teacher, responsible to uphold law or tradition, in this case, the Ten Commandments. I'm sure that won't have any relevance later. We see our serial shithead struck again, and we quickly bounce over to a playground, where the three musketeers find another assortment of hands, eyes, and teeth. And if you were wondering why these people were murked, the movie literally spells it out for you. Alright, all third graders in the audience caught up? Good, let's move on. We see the hell priest just chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, and the cops pad the runtime with random nonsense. We finally get a piece of useful info, and the three cops head over to Carl's place, only to see the one and only Heather Langenkamp. She does literally nothing but let them into the perp's apartment. Seriously, she's in the movie for 45 seconds, yet is still fourth build in the opening credits. Then again, she's realistically the only talented actor in this thing, so I wouldn't be upset if she was top build. After using the same establishing shot for the third time, Sean heads back to the place alone. So they all went there for five seconds, went back to the station, only to go back to the same flat immediately after? I feel like I just fell into an Elm Street time loop. The only bit of relevance this scene has is Sean pops open Carl's laptop, only to find the address of the gateway to hell from the opening. Oh, and that was the same address from the first Hellraiser. Boy, I was shocked to learn that, being that implies someone working on this has actually seen it. Sean, without calling for backup or doing anything intelligent, decides to check out the shady crack house himself, only to wake up tied to a chair. You're the world's worst detective. We once again see the pussy version of Riddick, who begins to conduct another interview. They discuss what horrors Sean saw while at war, and Carney's performance isn't half bad, but it's no First Blood or American Sniper, that's for sure. The only halfway decent scene so far concludes with white Marcellus Wallace here allowing the same disgusting paper-eating procedure to occur, but this time it fucks up the assessor more than a late-night Taco Bell binge. And he... dies? Guess Sean is a really bad dude, in case you still haven't sniffed out that twist. Dr. Evil's stunt double then hightails it to talk with an angel, and it's so blurry I wasn't sure if my prescription suddenly changed. Why are you here? Let him go. He has no business here. I don't understand. Well, well. And she tells the auditor to let Sean go. So he decides to go see Pinhead instead, who is just sitting on the Iron Throne doing jack shit. Oh, and we see Sean somehow manage to kill the three demon chicks, steal one of the puzzle boxes, and escape all without being noticed. Jeez, Pinhead, couldn't you splurge for a security system? Now this moron's back on the streets. Sean begins driving around like a schizo lunatic, clearly terrified after seeing discount Ernst Blofeld here. And since this movie is the cinematic equivalent of a broken record, we go right back to the hellhole from two seconds ago, only to see they all packed it up and got out of there and skipped town faster than a circus. Sean and David begin to have a little kerfuffle. What are you doing, Kevin? I'm creating a kerfuffle. Oh, damn. And it just ends with, well, the scene ending. 
A lot of the movie is like that. Lots of buildup just to fuck off to the next scene. Sean heads home and hits the hay, only to wake up in a Cenobite nightmare that heavily reminds me of fire in the sky. But he just wakes up and is consoled by his wife. I would say it's sweet of her, but the only other scene she's been in, she was being a royal bitch, so I don't even know what to think. Hopping back over to David and Christine, he's heavily questioned about Sean's past, and David is about as useful as a wet napkin. Dave gets out of there and goes to pick up his brother and wakes him up from a drunken stupor. They have another bit of bickering, and Sean says the same thing he told the auditor about being judged. God will judge both the righteous man and the wicked man. It's almost as if the movie wants us to remember this detail. Huh. Sean goes to take a shit, and David pops open one of his brother's books to see certain phrases have been double annotated, being highlighted and underlined for extra effect. After some more pointless cop dialogue, Christine and Sean take a car ride filled with even more irritating interrogation. Let me save all of us the trouble by flashing to something important. They go to see this guy who's dressed like Ace Ventura, and we find out this guy managed to break into the dead girl's phone and find the location of her murder. I would ask how they managed to break into the phone, but someone that dumb surely doesn't have a password on her phone. We skip over to Los Santos Customs, and once inside, we see some sort of sadistic trophy room of all of his victims. But there's one more surprise hidden behind a curtain. Holy shit. That's right, Sean's brother was sleeping with his wife. When was this established? Well, she called David once to tell him to pick up Sean. That's it. If that's not a Romeo and Juliet story, I don't know what is. Plus, one more blatant detail is revealed. Yep, Sean was the preceptor, in case that wasn't made crystal clear. I mean, there's only like five human characters in this movie, and the only other one that would have made sense has been dead for three-fourths of the runtime. Hell, even Heather Langenkamp being the killer would have been more shocking. Anywho, David heads over to the building, only to be held at gunpoint by his bro, and he explains how he figured it all out. After throwing that quote Sean kept blabbering on about into a search engine almost as bad as the one in Ouija, turns out it means none other than... Perceptor. Fuck you! So, Sean, if you were the one doing the killings, why the fuck would you tell your brother, a detective, a quote that literally means the name of your serial killer alias? You might as well have handed him a piece of paper that said, by the way, I'm the killer, see you at Sunday dinner. So Sean brings this love triangle to a head and puts that stolen lament configuration to good use as he makes the dirty little sinners unleash Pinhead and the Auditor. And just like always, the douchebag, asshole character tries trading his soul for his friends or family, and just like always, the Cenobites aren't having it. I brought them to trade for me. I'd like to see a Hellraiser movie where that shit actually works. But since Dave and Allison are both shitty people too, they're promptly dragged away. <sighs> Seeing this Dukes of Hazzard ruining fuck bite the big one is... the best thing I'll see this week. Anyways, the angel from before returns to say that Sean's not allowed to be taken right now, for some reason, and instead he receives her blessing. He's sent back to Earth only to... get shot by Christine. So if the gods can control that sort of thing, why'd they let that happen? And even more frightening, how was Edgerton's head not a pile of mush? He pistol whipped her several times and she's just fine? Throw a band-aid on it and call it a day? What the shit? That was stupid. Back in hell, Pinhead chains up the angel and gives her some wicked piercings, so as one last ditch effort, she turns Pinhead into the most terrifying, torturous, and agonizing thing in the entire universe. A homeless man. Yeah, I don't know how or why either, it just kinda ends. Oh, and for the hell of it, we get a post credit scene where we find out the Hell House is now in Germany, and takes two Mormons. Two. And it isn't even a Tuesday. I was half expecting Nick Fury to pop out and discuss the Slasher Avenger initiative. And that was Hellraiser Judgment, and... Well... It was better than Revelations. But then again, I'm pretty sure the only way they could make a sequel worse than that is if the whole movie was nothing but someone sparking up a lighter and setting a copy of Hellraiser on fire. And even that'd be more exciting. For what we did get with this 10th installment, it was... 
still pretty mediocre. For one, I think the modern world not being impressed by Cenobite's thing could have worked if done correctly. Instead, it was mentioned once or twice and then we just dove headfirst into the same generic Hellraiser crap we've seen before. The A and B stories were about as interwoven as Twilight Zone episodes, and the only thing reminding you it is a Hellraiser movie was the glimpses of Bennett and the Auditor sprinkled in between boring cop scenes. The pacing was another glaring issue. They really stretched this flick by repeating the same scenes with slight variations or having characters go back and forth just to extend the runtime. Plus, the almost 13 minute opening served no purpose other than introducing the Hell House element that wasn't really a part of the rest of the movie anyway. It's seen once more and then just abandoned until the post credits Scene. The characters were pretty bad as well, and the performances were hit or miss. Damon Carney showed a tad bit of talent, but that's about it. The other handful of human characters were not interesting, nor fleshed out enough for me to be invested in them. Sean being the killer was not only not a shocking reveal in the slightest, but the way they kept dragging out the reveal made the climax feel an hour long. One thing I do have positive things to say about is, ironically enough, the thing I haven't had anything good to say about in around five movies, The Cenobites. Paul T. Taylor did a much better job playing Pinhead than the last guy, and was actually pretty good in the role. If they end up making an 11th movie and Bradley still doesn't want to come back, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing Taylor again. And the auditor gets a big thumbs up from me. After the Cenobite dog, pseudo Pinhead, and fucking camera head, it's nice to see a mostly fresh, creepy addition to the Cenobite family. And Tuna Cliff knocks it out of the park. Overall, this movie is just kind of shoddy to me, and has a few good things mixed in with a bunch of bad ones. I like The Auditor and Damon Carney, but I really didn't like the mediocre killer twist, mostly bad performances, and lack of understanding of the Cenobites and Hellraiser lore. I'm going to give Hellraiser Judgment a D. It's certainly not the worst Hellraiser sequel, but is a step up from the last few for sure. And before we get out of here, since this is the last Hellraiser movie to date, I'd like to discuss where I'd like to see the series go from here. Remake. Now, I'm not a huge fan of remakes, but being the series has such a rich lore with so many things you could do with it, I think starting from scratch with someone talented in the director's chair could do a lot more good than continuing on from here. Sell the rights. The only reason a lot of these terrible Hellraiser movies exist to begin with is because Dimension Films and the Weinstein Company are trying their best to hold this franchise hostage by making the bare minimum amount of movies to keep the rights, and I think if this series was given to another studio, it could actually lead to another good movie being made. Story switch up. Maybe try a new storyline, or switch up the location. I'd love to see a Hellraiser movie set entirely in Hell, showing how the Cenobites operate and how they actually torment their victims rather than just being chained up and taken away. Seeing the inner workings of the most terrifying seekers of sensation could be amazing. Hell, anything would be better than what we've been getting. They don't even try anymore, and it's sad that one of the best horror icons of all time has been in more bad movies than good ones. Pinhead and the rest of the Cenobites deserve better and I'd love to see a day where I can feast my eyes upon a movie just as good as the original or Hellbound, but as it stands, that's about as unlikely as it gets. Now, there's only one more hurdle to jump. And what's that? Facing me. Whoa. Thanks. I didn't do that for you. I did that. Because I want a piece. Oh, come on! Ow! What the hell? You were gonna stab me? Yeah, but you got a gun. Not cool.